Good morning, Triangle Grace Church. We're glad that you've joined us for worship this morning. And we pray God's richest blessing upon you as we all gather together uh, in the name of the Lord. A few announcements as we prepare our hearts to enter into worship today. First, uh, just last Wednesday, we started a new Bible study. I'm teaching through the Gospel of John. If you would like to be a part of that study, it's easy for you to get on to Zoom. We do that via that uh, platform. Just send us your email address at triangle, office at trianglegrace.org, office at trianglegrace.org. We'd be happy to put you on our mailing list. That means you'll get uh, all of the video devotionals that we do and uh, announcements that we make throughout the week. So if you're not a regular part of our church family, we'd love to have you join in some of these other uh, areas as well. So we do this at Wednesday at 6 o'clock, and we just started last week, so uh, it, we'd love to have more join in that, uh, that Bible study experience. Uh, we're still planning our outdoor gleaning project at Sullivan Farms in Lucama, North Carolina. Uh, that uh, target date is September 26th. Uh, if you're a member of uh, Triangle Grace Church, you should have gotten a sign up for that just this past week. Make sure that you fill that out and send it back to us so that we'll know who's coming. And we also need to know who might have pickup trucks who can help transport boxes of sweet potatoes back to Durham after we have completed that, uh, that task. Uh, it's a great opportunity to be together as a church family. It's really easy to be socially distanced uh, in those fields. They're huge fields. And uh, so we hope that you'll come and help us glean sweet potatoes that will then be taken to uh, Iglesia Emanuel for their food pantry. Uh, our young people, our youth, are going to be meeting this afternoon, both groups, uh, at different times. You should have gotten some information from Pastor Jeff. If you need that information, you can still email Pastor Jeff, and he'll be happy to get back to you or text him, and uh, he'll respond to you as well. Uh, they're going to be outside, socially distanced, wearing face coverings, all of those things that we know we need to do, uh, but here on property. Uh, if you are interested in being in a small group, uh, we have some opportunities available to you. Uh, once again, if you'll just email us, uh, we will pass along that information to Kevin Mercer, who is our elder who oversees our small group ministry, and he'd love to help get you plugged into a group that you can commune with and study with. That's it for our announcements for today. Let's worship the Lord, hearing these words <clears throat> from the prophet Jeremiah. Familiar words. For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good and not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. In those days when you pray, I will listen. If you look to me in earnest, you will find me when you seek me. I will be found by you, says the Lord. Friends, this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Let us join together in prayer. Lord Jesus, we praise your name. We know that our Redeemer is faithful and true. We are confident that your steadfast love endures forever. You are the Alpha and the Omega. Lord, we thank you that you are here with us this day, that you love us, that you are our Lord and our Savior. Lord, may all that we do this morning glorify you Help us to be united one to another and to you. Thank you, Lord, for your love. We praise your name, Jesus. It is in your name, Jesus, that we pray. Amen. Let us continue our worship. Let us sing more love, more power.
I would like to invite you, if you're able, please stand right where you are so we may be unified as we say together the affirmation of faith, the Apostles' Creed. Christians, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. I want to invite all of our young disciples to come a little closer to the screen this morning as uh, I have a word just for you. Uh, we're going to be looking at some interesting people, uh, particularly people who are in the Old Testament. And some of them are famous people and some of them are not so famous people. My guess is that at least for right now, you're probably not what people would think of as famous. I'm certainly not a person that's known as being famous. There are lots of people who have no idea who you are or who I am. But the good news is God knows who all of us are. And the stories that we're going to read in the Old Testament, and one in particular today, talk about two people who perhaps you wouldn't even know what their names were. Now, the Bible tells us their names, but they're not particularly familiar names. They're names that when I read them to you, you'll think, hmm, maybe I've never heard that name before. But God used them in a really significant way to make sure that his plan of salvation was going to continue on through the people of Israel. And the good news of that story is that God can use famous people, but God can use ordinary people just like you and me, to do his special work. No matter what your name is, no matter how old you are, how tall or short you happen to be, God can use you. You have great potential because your life is in God's hands. And because of that, God can do some pretty amazing things just where you are. So let's thank God that he doesn't just use famous people to do his work, but he uses ordinary people like you and like me. Let's pray together. O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. We look at the heavens, the work of your hands on the earth, and, and we wonder why you would even care for us, ordinary people like us. But your word tells us that you have loved us with an everlasting love and you've demonstrated that love in that while we were still in rebellion against you and your lordship, you sent Jesus to take our sin upon himself, to die in our place on the cross. Lord, we cannot fathom the depth of such love. As we come to you in worship today, we pray that in all that we do, in all that we say, in all that we sing, that in every way you'll be glorified in our lives. Our worship seems a meager response <clears throat> to your goodness, to your grace. But we bring it with sincere hearts and, and a heartfelt desire to bring honor to you because you alone deserve our praise and our adoration. We confess that our discipleship this past week has been inconsistent at best. 
We failed to use opportunities that you've placed before us. And we've chased after our own wants and our own wishes and desires while leaving your work undone. Forgive our waywardness and continue to draw us to yourself. When our hearts are plagued with doubt, give us the gift of faith. When we doubt your love or question your mercy, speak your word of grace into our hearts once again. We ask for your mercy as we think about the world of today. We know there is much that must grieve your heart as those you have created search for meaning and purpose apart from you. We pray that you would use us to be instruments of your peace, but also as conduits of your love, which has the power to speak your redeeming word into the lives of the lost. We pray for those who are hurting this day to the lo- due to the loss of loved ones. We pray for loved ones and friends who are suffering because of illness or stress. We pray not only that uh, our troubles, we don't pray that they would be taken away, but you would give us the strength we need day by day to just simply survive, to get through those things, to, to be victorious in this walk of faith. We pray for our leaders locally and nationally and internationally. We pray for communities that have been ravaged with hurricane and tornado and fire and war and famine. The needs of the world are overwhelming to us, Father. But we trust that you are in control. And we pray that you would mobilize your people to meet the needs wherever they may be found. And all this we pray in the name of Jesus the great shepherd of the sheep, even as we pray the prayer that he taught his disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We have a special guest with us today, Yael Panetta Hall, and she's going to be singing a wonderful uh, song for us. I hope that you'll you'll sit back, but especially that you'll allow her voice uh, to help you worship this morning. Strength through weakness to show. 
I wish that you were in this place this morning so that you could say amen to that. Yael, thank you for helping me to worship this morning. Wow, that was fantastic. Now, friends, we're going to turn to God's Word, uh, two passages of Scripture that I'll read at different times, uh, both from the Old Testament, one from Genesis, uh, the book of beginnings, and then we'll uh, look at Exodus a bit later on. So if you have your Bible, let me invite you to turn to what is a familiar story in Genesis chapter 39. As we come to God's Word, let me invite you to pray with me. Gracious God, there is strength in your name. There is power in your name. And we call upon the power of your Holy Spirit who breathed out this word long ago that it might be through your power breathed into our hearts and lives this day. And so, Lord, use this time this morning to speak into the hearts and lives of your children and this we pray in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. Genesis chapter 39, beginning with verse 1. Now Joseph had been brought down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the guard, an Egyptian, had bought him from the Ishmaelites who had brought him down there. The Lord was with Joseph, and he became a successful man, and he was in the house of his Egyptian master, his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord caused all that he did to succeed in his hands. So Joseph found favor in the sight of him who he attended and, and he made him overseer of his house and put him in charge of all that he had. From that time, uh, he made him overseer in his house and all that he had. The Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. The blessing of the Lord was on all that he had, in house and field. So he left all that he had in Joseph's charge, and because of him he had no concern about anything but the food he ate. Now Joseph was handsome in form and appearance, and after a time his master's wife cast her eyes on Joseph and said, Lie with me. But he refused, and he said to his master's wife, Behold, because of me, my master has no concern about anything in the house, and he has put everything that he has in my charge. He is not greater in this house. He is not greater in this house than I am, nor has he kept anything back from me except you, because you are his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? And as she spoke to Joseph day after day, he would not listen to her to lie beside her or to be with her. But one day when he went into the house to do his work and none of the men of the house was there in the house, she caught him by his garment saying, lie with me. But he left his garment in her hand and fled and got out of the house. And as soon as she saw that he had left his garment in her hand and had fled out of the house, she called to the men of her household and said to them, See, he has brought among us a Hebrew to laugh at us. He came into me to lie with me, and I cried out with a loud voice. And as soon as he heard that, I lifted up my voice and cried out. He left his garment beside me and fled and got out of the house. Then she laid up his garment by until her master came home, and she told him the same story, saying, The Hebrew servant whom you have brought among us came in to me to laugh at me. But as soon as I lifted up my voice and cried, he left his garment beside me and fled out of the house. As soon as his master heard the words that his wife spoke to him, This is the way your servant treated me? His anger was kindled. And Joseph's master took him and put him in prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined. And he was there in prison. But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him steadfast love and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And the keeper of the prison put Joseph in charge of all the prisoners who were in the prison. Whatever was done there, he was the one who did it. 
the keeper of the prison paid no attention to anything that was in Joseph's charge because the Lord was with him, and whatever he did, the Lord made it succeed. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. Well, for those of you who kind of hung in there with us uh, last year, we, we took a long time making our way through uh, the New Testament book of James. Uh, that being the case, I thought it might be a good thing for us to spend a little time in the Old Testament. And so beginning today and then for a number of weeks, we're going to be looking at some stories of uh, characters in the Old Testament some of them are well known. Uh, you might even think of them as perhaps household names. Uh, if you had grown up in church or in vacation Bible school, you would have recognized their names immediately. But there are others who perhaps you have not heard of. Others who in certain cases are left unnamed. Uh, so we're going to look at a few of those uh, well-known people, but we're going to spend a good bit of our time uh, looking at those who are less familiar. Uh, one of the things that I did when I was on study leave this past summer, when I decided to begin this series, I thought, well, let me just read through and kind of skim the Old Testament and, and see who's there. And I was surprised to run across a number of stories of, and names of people that I wasn't particularly uh, uh, knew about, uh, that I was, uh, uh, found them to be people who were interesting, who had done significant things, but were certainly not household names. And as I said before, some of them are literally unnamed. So beginning today and for the next number of weeks, we're going to be looking at what I'm calling uh, ordinary people Extraordinary God. That's the name of our sermon series uh, going forward uh, through this fall. Ordinary people, extraordinary God. Uh, and today we're going to look at what, at first glance, may seem to be unrelated stories. Uh, one we've already read in Genesis, uh, the story of a man who is quite well known. Um, if you're a fan of Broadway, even if you're a non-Christian, people know the name of Joseph, the guy with the amazing technicolor dream coat. Uh, we know his story. We know lots about Joseph, uh, and we know that he had a difficult time. Uh, he was blessed by God, but he, uh, throughout his life, found himself in circumstances that were unjust and simply unfair. But he was blessed by God, and God used him in some mighty ways to benefit the people of Israel. Here's a guy who is constantly experiencing time after time these injustices. Now, he might have complained, but we really don't get that sense of him uh, in the scriptures themselves. In fact, what we more often see is that Joseph tried to see things in a broader perspective in terms of how God was using him in the places where he found himself. And one of the, the most oft-quoted uh, things that Joseph ever said is that line where uh, we know that his brothers have sold him into slavery and eventually it comes around that his brothers are in his, uh, in his presence because he's now risen to this great place in the people of, uh, in, the, in the court of the Pharaoh in Egypt. And because he's done that, uh, he has great power and he oversees all the food distribution and his family needed food so they came to Egypt to try and get food. They, they don't know who he is. Finally he's revealed to them and they're scared to death. Uh, and, and then as it turns his father dies and they're in his presence again and, and they're scared to death because they think Joseph is going to now do to them some of the things that they had done to him. But Joseph says this line. He says, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. When people are faced with trials in life, it seems that they turn one of two ways. Uh, one way is they lash out at the people who are around them, those who are closest to them. Sometimes that includes God. They, they shake their fist at God. But the others seem to lean more heavily into God. They, they try to find ways that they can be blessings 
to those around them. They try to find ways that they can serve other people as a way of responding even to the injustices that they have experienced. Joseph is obviously one of those people who, who leaned more completely into God. And the text tells us that God blessed him. And we know that God used him in some mighty ways, even uh, in a culture that was not his own. Uh, the text we read today recounts of the time when uh, he had been sold into slavery. Uh, the Ishmaelites had bought him from his brothers, and, and they had ended up in Egypt. And then uh, Potiphar, who was a high-ranking uh, military man in, in the uh, Pharaoh's army, had bought him from the Ishmaelites, and, and he had made him overseer of his entire house. And everything that Joseph did sort of turned to gold for Potiphar. It was a, a situation where he recognized that his house was being blessed because Joseph was there. Uh, but Potiphar's wife tried to seduce him, and he resists her at every turn. And finally, he literally runs out of the house, but she grabs hold of his garment and, and has it in her hand as he leaves. And uh, even though he had acted with integrity in every single way, he still was met with injustice uh, because there are unjust people in the world like Potiphar's wife. Uh, only in looking to the end of the story do we see how these difficult circumstances ultimately uh, led to God being able to use Joseph in a particular way as he interpreted some dreams, which brought him to an even higher level in the government of Pharaoh. So Joseph continued to give his total allegiance to God, and God gave him this special ability to uh, interpret dreams. He becomes head in the court of Pharaoh, uh, and that's what brings him into contact with his family, who brothers who had literally sold him into slavery. So what we find is Joseph, through all of this stuff going in and out, all of these circumstances, was a major player in the role of salvation for the people of Israel. You know, I think it's significant that somehow God enabled him to finally pull off the miracle of being admired by his own people and also respected by the people who were in Egypt, uh, even though that wasn't his culture. That's not an easy thing to pull off to be uh, seen in a good way by both of those people, those that aren't our people, those that are our people. As fascinating, though, as the story of Joseph is, his story is really just a setup. All of that was really just a setup for the story I really want to draw our attention to this morning. Uh, for our purposes today, the significant thing about Joseph is that he was ultimately forgotten, at least by the royal line in Egypt. He's forgotten. Turn in your Bible with me now to uh, our second passage. We're going to be looking at Exodus chapter 1 and beginning with verse 1. We're going to start with what, verse 1. This is what Exodus says. These are the names of the sons of Israel who came to Egypt with Jacob, each with his household. Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, and Benjamin, Dan, and Naphtali, Gad, and Asher. All the descendants of Jacob were 70 persons. Joseph was already in Egypt. Then Joseph died, and all his brothers and all that generation. But the people of Israel were fruitful and increased greatly. They multiplied and grew exceedingly strong so that the land was filled with them. Now there arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph. And he said to his people, Behold, the people of Israel are too many and too mighty for us. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, lest they multiply, and if war breaks out, they join our enemies and fight against us and escape from the land. Therefore they set up taskmasters over them to afflict them with heavy burdens. They built for Pharaoh store cities, Pithom and Ramses. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and the more they spread abroad. And the Egyptians were in dread, fearful of the people of Israel. 
So they ruthlessly made the people of Israel work as slaves and made their lives bitter with hard service in mortar and brick and in all kinds of work in the field. In all their work, they ruthlessly made them work as slaves. Then the king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, one of whom was named Shifra and the other Puah, when you serve as midwife to the Hebrew women and see them on the birth stool, if it is a son, you shall kill him. But if it is a daughter, she shall live. But the midwives feared God and did not do as the king commanded them and let the male children live. So the king of Egypt called the midwives and said to them, why have you done this and let the male children live? The midwives said to Pharaoh, because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, for they are vigorous and give birth before the midwife comes to them. So God dealt well with the midwives, and the people multiplied and grew very strong, because the midwives feared God. He gave them families. Then Pharaoh commanded all his people, every son that is born to the Hebrews, you shall cast into the Nile but you shall let every daughter live. Once again, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So the book of Exodus now begins with this genealogy of sorts of the people of Israel who found themselves uh, in Egypt. Uh, It goes through what are called the sons of Israel. And in relaying this, you get down to verse 5 and it says, Joseph was already in Egypt. Uh, And then comes this significant statement in verse 6. Then Joseph died. When we drop down to verse 8, we come upon the reason why it's so significant that Joseph had died. And this is the part that really binds these two stories together. It says, now there arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph. So it turns out it doesn't take very long to be forgotten, apparently. Even if you were a famous person, powerful in government. I think of the number of formerly well-known world leaders who are really not known by our current generation. From even a faith perspective, I'm still at times taken by surprise when I'm talking with young people and they have no idea who Billy Graham was. He died in February of 2018. That's like three years, less than three years. And was perhaps the most famous preacher that America has ever had. And yet by some already forgotten. See, Joseph had been the buffer between Pharaoh and the people of Israel. The Israelites' life was better because Joseph was in their corner. And he died. And enough time had elapsed that a new king had taken the throne. And this new king had forgotten who Joseph was. So what happens when the famous are forgotten? Don't you imagine that there were times for the people of Israel that they looked back nostalgically on those times and and thought to themselves, if only Joseph were here, he would fix this. If only Joseph were here, he could talk with the Pharaoh and and could ease our burdens just a bit. I wonder if in our day there are some who are wishing even now, if only Dr. Graham or if only Dr. King were here to speak into these circumstances, perhaps our lives would be better. Perhaps there would be more reconciliation in this world. The reality for the people of God is this. When famous people have been forgotten, we simply have to move on in the confidence that God is still in control and will use others to accomplish his divine purpose. And what we see in these stories is that sometimes God uses unlikely people to play some pretty significant roles in his plan of salvation. Today is an example of just that. When the text says Joseph was no longer remembered, that is our signal that the favor that Joseph had 
had gotten from Pharaoh, the favor that Joseph had experienced and had passed along to the Hebrews had now dried up. The new king could have cared less about the Hebrew people. In fact, he feared them because he was worried that there were already too many of them. He worried that, that, that they would take over, if you will. Fear can be a powerful motivator. And this king is just fearful that these Hebrews are, are multiplying too fast. He feared that, that their rising numbers, it would eventually create a people that, that if someone else had come to war against him and they teamed up with that other nation, that his government could be overthrown. Pharaoh's plan became one of oppression. He tormented and worked the Hebrew people so hard that he believed they couldn't multiply. He apparently thought that if he worked them ruthlessly as slaves, the population would, would finally be controlled. That was his plan A, but it didn't work. Scripture tells us the Israelite population continued to grow, and that caused Pharaoh to, to institute plan B, and this is where the two women with little-known names come into play. Isn't it just like God to pick two unknown people to play a significant role in his ongoing plan? I suppose that we're all unknowns until God touches us on the shoulder and calls us into his service. Who have you had remembered the names of Shifra and Pua before I read them in our text today? And even if you remembered their names, could you have told their story? Could you have told me what they did in the history of Israel? Well, they're midwives, women whose job it was to help deliver the Hebrew babies. What we don't know is if they were the only two midwives or, or they happened to be uh, two midwives who, like Joseph, had somehow found themselves in the favor of Pharaoh. Or, or perhaps they were just the only two whose names could be remembered. His basic instruction was rather simple. If a Hebrew has a baby boy, kill that boy. Only allow the girls to survive. It's hard to imagine that anyone could even make such an atrocious and heartless demand, but we know there have been similar edicts in our modern era. era. Think of genocide. But these two women, you see, refuse to obey that command. And a simple explanation is given for their unwillingness to do that murderous action. The text says they feared God. Finding that they had disobeyed his order, the king called them in once again. Can you imagine what must have been going through their hearts and their minds as they were being called back into the presence of Pharaoh? I wonder if they thought that their lives were going to come to an end because they had disobeyed that order. Remember, this was a man who didn't think twice about killing newborn babies. He asked them, why they had not done what he told them to do. In other words, why did you let the Hebrew baby boys live? Then they made up a story, I guess, about how Hebrew women are so hardy, not like the, the Egyptian women. No, they're, they're hardy. They don't even need midwives to help them give birth. And so the birth has already taken place before we even got there. Then we get a little commentary that says, so God dealt well with the midwives and people multiplied and grew very strong and because the midwives feared God he gave them families which by the way would have been perhaps the greatest blessing that God could have placed upon their lives we don't know their stories perhaps they were barren and God reversed that and and now gave them families why because they feared God and because they obeyed God now, why is this such a significant story? 
Well, it's because the action of this king would have put every Israelite mother on high alert if they were going to deliver a baby. And I would imagine that many of them took precautions to protect the lives of their baby boys. And such was the case for a Levite woman who gave birth to a son who would eventually be named Moses. Chapter 2 of Exodus begins his story, and there we read that his mother hid him for three months after he was born. Perhaps that happened because of the action of these midwives who refused to do what Pharaoh had told them to do, and yet the word had been spread concerning what they were supposed to do. And so we can learn from these two courageous women, Shifra and Pua. We can learn from them, I think, some valuable lessons that help us as we seek to fear God, as we seek to honor and reverence God, as we seek to live as God's people in our time, in our day. First, one of the things that we might see is eventually we'll be forgotten. But that doesn't diminish the impact that we can have right now. Each of you has a mission to fulfill in the kingdom of God. God has given each of us certain gifts and certain abilities, and God gives us opportunities to use those gifts and those abilities for his glory and for the purpose of building up his kingdom. Some will have opportunity to do big things, to reach thousands of people. We know about the Beth Moores and the Tony Evans and the Max Lucados and the Priscilla Shirers who have large audiences that, that reach out far beyond their local community to minister to God's kingdom, in many cases worldwide. We can thank God for the impact of the Josephs the famous ones of the world. But we also need to remember that God can use the Shifras and the Puas of the world just as well. The important thing is not whether we become famous or not. It may never be that we have opportunity to speak to a large audience or have that kind of global impact. What is important is that we do what we can do with what God has given us concerning abilities, concerning opportunities. We simply have to be ready to step up in those places where God opens a door. Second, Shifra and Pua help us to understand it is never wrong to do the right thing. They were willing to stand against the unrighteous edict of a murderous king. And they did so at great peril to themselves. If you ever wonder if peaceful civil disobedience can be a godly choice, this is your answer. I was reminded this week uh, of someone who had mentioned the name of Corey Tinboom, and, and I remembered her family and her story that's recounted in the book The Hiding Place. And how her family took a courageous stand against a corrupt government in order to save the lives of many innocent Jews during the Holocaust. And they put their own lives at risk. Of her family, Corey was the only survivor. We're told the earthly blessings came to Shifra and Pua because they honored God. In other words, because they did the right thing. Uh, some may say, well, gee, didn't they tell a lie? That's to miss the point. They were rewarded for their faithfulness, for doing the right thing in a horrible circumstance. I would say further, we have to realize that there is a great reward for such actions. Obedience to God always carries the reward of God's blessing. We know there are times when the righteous are persecuted and even lose their lives because of their faithfulness. But God is always faithful. 
And we can be assured that when we honor the Lord by living faithful lives, it is never done in vain. There is a greater reward coming. We don't experience God's kingdom in all of its glory yet. But the day is coming when we will. And in that day, I am sure there are many who are going to experience an incredible reward given to them because of their faithfulness in horrific situations. And third, sometimes the right actions of godly people bring about positive consequences that they may never see, nor could they have ever imagined them. In this case, we see the birth of Moses, who became God's instrument to bring about liberation for God's people from the very people of Egypt. Shifra and Pua could never have imagined that the result of their action would ultimately bring about the liberation of their nation. Paul tells us in Ephesians that God is able to do exceeding abundantly more than we would ever ask or think according to the power, meaning his power, that is at work within us. Friends, we worship an extraordinary God who is able to use ordinary people like two faithful but virtually unknown women named Shifra and Pua. And he's able to use ordinary people like you and like me as we yield ourselves to his purposes, as we yield ourselves to his plan that we are able to see in his word. You can make an impact for the kingdom right now, wherever you are. You have opportunities that are before you where you can speak a word of truth into a world that seems to love in many ways falsehood. You can be God's person wherever you are. You can show his love, his mercy, his grace. You can reach out to, to those who are hurting with God's peace. There are many who just simply need someone to come alongside and help them understand that there is a God who loves them more than they could ever imagine. You may be the conduit of that love. If you're discouraged in, in what you're experiencing, just remember, friends, it's never wrong to do the right thing. Eventually, things are going to settle out in God's purpose and plan, and you'll be able to see that clearly. Sometimes we're not able to see it yet. But just remember, it's never wrong to do the right thing. And finally, because you may not be aware of it, eventually you may impact something that happens in the world, something that happens in God's kingdom that you're not even aware of. God can use ordinary people like Shifra and like Pua and like you and like me. Thank God that we have this extraordinary God who is willing to use people, ordinary people, like us. Amen. Our closing hymn today is going to be more about Jesus. Hopefully you'll see that on your uh, worship sheet. Let's join our voices together as we sing.
us in his word. Holy communion with my Lord, hearing his voice in every line, leaving each faithful saying mine. For more about Jesus, for more about Jesus, for his saving for the sea, for of his love who died for me. For about Jesus on his throne, riches in glory. Friends, I may not even know your name, but you're significant in God's plan, in God's purpose. God knows our names. He knew the names of Shifra and Pua, and he used them in great ways to bring about the salvation of his people, the rescue of his people from Egypt. And all of that ultimately leads down to Jesus who came to save you and me from our sin, to give us new lives. Let's share that good news. Let's do what we can do where we are as God's people, famous and not so famous. Let's be the people God's called us to be wherever he plants us. Let's use the opportunities that he gives us. So be God's people wherever you are in your world. And as you do that, may you experience God's peace. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, our Heavenly Father, the fellowship and communion of the Holy Spirit be with you, abide with you, uplift you, and empower you both now and forevermore. Amen. Have a great week, folks.